the natural conclusion of running a cohort of five is you need 60 to 80% of your graduates getting into the angel and venture markets out of the program. And we've been able to hold that number. So I think 60% of our graduates have raised more than a quarter million. I'm sorry, 60% have raised more than a million. 80% have raised more than a quarter million. And it's been a critical advantage for us as a portfolio design. The startup investment landscape is changing and world-class companies are being built outside of Silicon Valley. We find them, talk with them, and discuss the upside of investing in them. Welcome to Upside. Hello, 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 and welcome to the Upside Podcast, the first podcast finding upside outside of Silicon Valley. I'm Jay Klaus, and I'm accompanied by my co-host, Mr. Buzzed Head himself, Eric Hornung. Jay, we can start with the buzz head, but we all know what this is stemming from. This is stemming from my desire to try out some blonde hair. What do you think? I think both are horrible ideas. <laughs> I'm, I'm now more scared to do it because someone told me, well, you told me a story. Someone else told me a story about hair not growing back. So I don't want to buzz my head anymore, but that was going to be my scapegoat for if I hated dyeing my hair blonde, I would just buzz it and then it would grow back. It turns out it doesn't always grow back. Everyone with short hair aspires to have long hair. People have short hair. People buzz their head because it doesn't look good when it grows out. Otherwise, we would grow it out. I don't know why so you want to go the other direction. I just I, sometimes you just want to try different things, man. You know, grass is always greener on the other side. Why not grow a beard? I've had a beard. I get too much of a neck beard. It gets kind of gross. You can solve for that. No one with a good beard has a neck beard. Also, a friend of the podcast, Colleen, is not a fan of the beard. Is she a fan of buzzed hair or blonde hair? Um, The jury is out. (laughs) Because that's that's a much longer road back if it doesn't go well. I think I could grow my hair out, you know, relatively quickly, assuming it comes back, which is the thing I'm scared about now. Are you having a quarter life crisis? I don't think I'm having a quarter life crisis, but I think that's what someone who is having a quarter life crisis might say. I've been getting a lot of emails from listeners of the show asking me if you're okay. They say it sounds like you're having a quarter life crisis. Oh, man. Well, you know, the nice thing about having a quarter life crisis is easy multiple on four on your age and you figure out how long you live to, which at this point is like 112. Yeah. So that seems fine. That's a lot of years. Well, Eric, I thought you were a better idea generator than this. We'll move on. We'll move into today's guest, the co-founder of Generator Accelerator, Joe Kurgis. Generator is a turnkey platform for the creative economy that connects startups, entrepreneurs, artists, investors, universities, and corporations. The Generator platform includes pre-accelerators, accelerators, corporate programming, conferences, and fellowships focused on entrepreneurs, artists, and musicians. Eric, we've been connected with Generator from the very beginning of this podcast when I met Sibby by chance here in Columbus, and he started feeding us some of our early guests on the pod from Kaleidoscope and Swannies and ParkX to Geno Palette. They have been a huge supporter, and it's going to be great to talk to Joe. But I have another idea for you, Jay. If you're worried about my idea generation, what do you think? Tattoo sleeve, one arm. Nope, another bad idea. Generator is founded in 2011, based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Joe co founded the Generator program where he manages the company's efforts along with his business partner, Troy Vossler. And they have a lot of programs now. It's not just an accelerator program, although their accelerator program is where they got their start, cohorts of five, a different approach than most accelerators. I'm excited to learn more about their suite of programs and get beyond just the companies that we've interviewed from the accelerator. Yeah, I think that this is a really fascinating company that's expanding. I think they are really focused on community. So I'm just really excited to hear about the history of Generator and kind of what they're looking at in the future. If you guys have any thoughts on this interview as we go through, as always, you can tweet at us at UpsideFM or email us hello at Upside.fm. Eric, how many people have you assisted in hiring? I used to do some interviews back in the day, hiring for a business fraternity. And now I do some interviews hiring for my full-time job. So I'd say I probably had a part in hiring or bringing on at least 100 people. How many of those people did you do the work of actually finding to bring into interview? It's way too much work, Jay. I don't I do not do that. That's too much. It's a lot of work to find high quality talent to come in an interview. 
and our friends at Integrity Power Search help you do just that. They are the number one full stack, high growth startup recruiting firm between the coasts. They partner with venture capitalists, private equity groups, and CEOs to build amazing teams for the world's most disrupting companies. Eric, since 2012, Integrity Power Search has executed over 600 searches, and they're on track to do more than 200 in 2019 alone. That means high quality candidates in front of you that you can interview without having to source them yourself. 600 sounds like way more than 100. Way more than 100, and think about all the hours saved not finding those candidates yourself. So if you guys are interested in working with Integrity Power Search, you can go to upside.fm slash integrity to learn more about their team and how they can help you with your hiring. Joe, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. We like to start on Upside with a background of the guests. So can you tell us about the history of Joe? Sure. Born and raised in Milwaukee. I went to school at Marquette University and and law school at Wisconsin Law School and transferred to being a federal law clerk and worked for two years in the Eastern District of Wisconsin. So I got to see the sort of inner workings of the FBI and the DEA and and the the federal judiciary and then went to a law firm and was tasked with determining how communities invest into themselves, especially with regard to venture capital, and came out with this sort of disappointing finding for myself and and generally bleak assessment that we were not investing into our communities in the way that other more successful cities were doing and that we were in a, a bit of a liquidity trap where big companies weren't buying little companies and there was not a focus on investing into our next generation and you can imagine you know 20 communities five of them are incredibly passionate about investing into themselves and their and their best and brightest five of which are not, you know, which do you foresee a bright future for? And unfortunately, I found our community to be in that bottom tier. So what could we do to begin changing that dynamic was sort of the writ large question that emerged. And I got a leave of absence from the firm and started working with my co-founder, Troy Vossler. And we got to work on trying to, from the ground up, get a community to invest into its best and brightest with this love letter we call Generator that it began, you know, in Milwaukee and Madison, but has since grown to well over a dozen cities. And that's sort of hopefully catches you up from you know where we started from and how it is I find myself working in startups and arts and music, which we'll talk more about, but was the original genesis. So Generator is known for having small cohorts. Is that by design or necessity? Both. Yeah. The model, you know, that's one of the original pieces that was you know, the most discussed. And I think one of the most critical decisions we made what would be the size of the, of the cohort? You know, as a cohort of five or six companies, and almost always five, that's the smallest in the industry to our knowledge in the startup space. Would we be able to be a viable fund? You know, we're a for profit fund. Can you build a model on a portfolio theory basis with cohorts that small? And on the flip side of it, in a dynamic like Milwaukee or in these sort of markets 10 through 100 in size, where you don't have as vibrant of an angel and venture community, and you need to make sure that you're graduating a sufficient number of companies into the angel and venture markets. The bet was, could we, by offering very concierge service and dedicating all of our resources you know, in this concentrated period of time to a very small number of startups, at least relatively small, would we be able to get a viable portfolio in the angel market? And so the natural conclusion of running a cohort of five is, you need 60 to 80% of your graduates getting into the angel and venture markets out of the program. And we've been able to hold that number. So I think 60% of our graduates have raised more than a quarter million. I'm sorry, 60% have raised more than a million. 80% have raised more than a quarter million. And it's been a critical advantage for us as a portfolio design. More important, as a product, it's enabled us to build relationships with founders that I could never have imagined had we been running cohorts of, you know, a cohort of 10 sounds huge to us. And just the one-on-one attention we're able to give each company and more importantly, the relationships we're able to build and how that informs where we're, you know, the context that we can, that we can use to our advantage to help them and to understand their problems and to focus our resources on their opportunities. I'm so glad we did it, but I'm glad you asked that question first because it is such a critical design feature of the, of the company in terms of how it is that we build our relationships with our, our founders, our customers, and how it is that we're able to build a viable program 
in these communities that aren't typically hotbeds for venture capital. Do you remember roughly how many applicants you had for that first class that you accepted five out of? Vividly, we had about 86. 86. And now I think I saw on their Wikipedia, you guys are doing something like close to 700 applicants in a cohort. Yeah, we had in the last Madison program, we had 1,050. You know, it's interesting. We talk about this a lot. There was a lot to be gained by having that small applicant pool that I think we were too busy trying to survive the month to appreciate. But what we saw was we were taking earlier stage companies with really bright people, and that invited more of what we call category design into the model, where people who were coming in, they weren't in motion, they hadn't built a business model, they hadn't faced that same pressure to build a, a relatively lightweight product that gets to revenue quickly. And we had more ability to design, you know, focus on the business model and design products that were as exciting at scale as they were at, you know, their first 10 customers. And it was an incredibly exciting time when we had that program. And we had, I think the first, one of the first companies that came through understory now is one of our most valuable and one of our most exciting. They were named as one of the most innovative companies in the world recently. And it was a lot of fun working with that design concept stage. It's also completely different working with a pool of 1,050 applicants where, you know, inevitably when we choose one out of the top 200 or whatever the acceptance rate is now, you know, they're probably a little further along. So both, both have their ups and downs, but it has changed the program dramatically as we've grown from that, that original applicant pool to, you know, an applicant pool 10 to 15 times that size. What's the difference between company number five that gets into generator and company number six that just misses the cut? Oh, it's brutal. I mean, one of our most valuable companies was because we did at one point take a cohort of six and they were the sixth company in. So we think about that a lot as what were the other six companies when we only took cohorts of five. Everyone, when we do it, you know, our final interviews of 10 or 15 companies, we want to invest in all of them. And frankly, it's a reflection of where we think we are in our angel and venture capacity and not where it is that we think that they deserve the investment that dictates who those top five are. And we're oftentimes trying to filter for, obviously, you know, where it is we think we can have the best success, but also where we can make the most impact. And when we're looking at a five or a six, it's oftentimes, is this a company we think, given our network and our expertise, that we're the best fit for? Because they're probably, at that stage, going to receive investment from someone. And are we the people who are going to be the best partners for them to build their business? But it's so subjective and much more art than science when you're trying to figure that, you know, a company at that at that quality, the top 0.4% of your applicant pool, it's all pretty good. It's, it's a lot, a lot of subjectivity. How often is there a clear number one? Uh, maybe a third of the time, half the time. It, it, there's definitely cases where you get a company that you're just, you know, that this is a great company and they're growing leaps and bounds and the angel and venture markets just didn't appreciate them the way that they should have. Other programs, you know, they're who you would rank potentially as number one could change by the week. I want to step back just a little bit quickly here. You guys have had something like 75 graduates of the program now. Something you said originally in your first response was that you were a law, a law clerk in that you were with a law firm tasked with determining how these communities invested in themselves. And you figured out that, well, Milwaukee isn't. Let's do something about that. Mm -hmm. Why was that even something that the law firm was doing or worried about and something that you were staffed on? The law firm had clients that were interested in doing angel investing. And so they were trying to figure out what would be the most appropriate way to do that. And there was some due diligence going on on a potential investment on a fund. And, and you think about it, and this is, I think, writ large across these markets, the private equity markets in the Midwest are dominant. So if you look at where, you know, imagine you have like a, a glass and you can turn it sideways and the water could move one way or another. The liquid can move, you know, more or less concentrated on either side. We've tipped our glass in the Midwest into private equity. And so there's within the law firms and the service industry, a disproportionate weighting of resources to where the assets under management reside. And right now the assets under management reside in buying and selling companies, largely in manufacturing or whatever industry the PE firm is targeting in, in the West, largely manufacturing, but also healthcare. And there's almost none in the venture capital side of that glass. The effect is that the most effective job creation capital is being invested elsewhere. And I think that the, in, the service industries are aware that there's this capability to build resources in the venture asset class, but they can't find anyone to manage that asset class as a client. And so that was, I think, what was going on writ large. And we see that across, across the upper Midwest. It's pretty a dominant theme. And what was the moment for you and your partner, Troy, to say, all right, not only have we identified this problem, but we're going to say 
it's on us that we're going to take a step and actually do something about it as opposed to go to someone else who maybe had more experience in the venture space. Yeah, we met, it was at a Starbucks in the Capitol Square in 2012. And we were talking about our shared belief that if we were to invest from the ground up in our best and brightest, and then properly merchandise them and market them to a marketplace, a robust marketplace of investors, we could build both a successful fund and create a highly levered mechanism for importing capital into our community. That's much more, well, I don't want to say well articulated, but it's a little bit more deliberate than I think just the sort of, hey, we're sitting in a coffee shop talking about what, what could be done. But we had a sense, a pretty well, you know, well expressed sense of if we get to work with these individual talented entrepreneurs and focus on their success pretty quickly, I think we'll see that this is an incredibly efficient mechanism for investing into the community. Could you talk now then, you know, we talked about kind of the inception of Generator and you guys were doing these really small cohorts. Now, fast forwarding to 2019, what is the breadth of what is under the Generator umbrella? Yeah. So our mission is we want to be the best partner for a community to invest into its best and brightest. Shorthand for that is locals investing in locals. The mechanism we've built to support that mission is a store with four products. Our first product is our venture fund. That's what runs the four the equity accelerators, the generator accelerators. So we have we operate cohorts of five generator accelerators in Madison, Milwaukee, and Minneapolis. We've also recently partnered with the Brandery in Cincinnati, and we operate that program as well. And we partnered with Allianz and Securian to run a, an accelerator focused on insure tech in Minneapolis as well. And so that's five accelerators, each of a cohort of five. So we'll be investing in 25 companies in 2019. And we anticipate expanding our footprint in 2020. That accelerator program has invested in, I think it's actually 91 companies now because we're graduating cohorts. You know, I think we graduated two in the last two months. The graduates have raised well over 250 million. I think it's over 300 million of follow-on capital, created over 3,000 jobs. And we've been ranked nationally by a group out of MIT and Rice University who they essentially administer a data colonoscopy to all the accelerators. And we came out in the top 15. And notably, we've been in the top 15 in the last four years. Everyone else in the top 15 is this year is in San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York. And it, it, we're the only one that operates outside of a big metro. So we're the Everywhere America Accelerator, which we're really proud of. But it speaks to the other three products. The way I describe the dynamic in the accelerator industry, the well functioning ecosystems, the accelerators are like a function of the airport. Imagine you've got an airport and that's that's the venture ecosystem. And people can come in and out and get where they need to go. The accelerators a, a function of that, air traffic control or a gate or an airline or something, something that adds to the quality of the airport and is critical to the airport's success, but not the airport. Now look at a market without a venture ecosystem. We have no airport. There aren't that width of resources available to the community to make sure that you can get it out where you need to go. So we've tried to create that airport-like function for our startups within the cohort, within the program. So that meant we need first to formalize our relationships with corporations. So we created a group called Project North. We have over 40 corporations. Over a quarter of them are in the Fortune 500. And we work with them in innovation and venture capital, technology, and M&A, where we've seen these corporations creating departments like those that are new to the corporate entity much like human resources and marketing was new 40 years ago, but there's no, in this case, for the innovation and technology executives, there isn't nearly that same width of best practice or that same kind of formal set of procedures that, that you can kind of buy the booklet and start implementing to, to make sure that you're able to create new products or to onboard skills that weren't otherwise in the organization in technology. And so we've been working on that for about four years now with Project North. And the members get a quarterly dinner where they present to each other and we bring in outside experts. We recently had a quarterly dinner featuring venture studios. We take them on trips. So we're going to LA this week where we're visiting all the different venture firms in that community and hearing from thought leaders in the technology and venture space from corporations. And then we run out stadiums and do conferences. So we just did one in insurance and healthcare. We had crowds of 600 to 1,000 people at each. And what's interesting about those conferences is we have every corporation get a luxury box suite. They then get a list of the two to 300 startups that apply from their industry. It's free for startups to apply. It's free for them to come if they're selected. And then we arrange speed dating for those corporations with their favorite 15. 
And the idea is, again, going to our mission of locals investing in locals. We want to make sure that our startups have the best access and that not only our startups, but the community startups have the best access to potential partners, potential customers, to the width of resources that they might need in order to scale and grow. And so that, that's our Project North, our second product. Our third product is our G-Beta program, which is a pre-accelerator where we work with partners such as universities, civic organizations like the Indiana Economic Development Corporation, and corporate partners like Boston Scientific and Capital yes. Records to better identify and support emerging entrepreneurs in a community and give them the same resources that the generator accelerator would offer. But in this case, we're offering it without taking any equity. And we're typically starting with founders who are even pre-entity. We're starting with founders who have yet to form an LLC or a C-Corp, and we're helping them take their first steps in entrepreneurship. And we're measured to our sponsors on the quality and quantity of the outcomes. So can we support you know, 10 to 15 startups in that market per year? And can we make sure that a third of them are graduating to the angel or, or accelerator or venture markets? And to date, we're, I think, up to 15 programs. We're graduating well over 100 startups this year. In the history of the program in the last three years, we've graduated well over 100 startups. They've raised over 40 million of follow-on capital and created over 600 jobs. Notably, over 50% of those startups have met our financing metrics. So we promised our sponsors a third. They've reached 50%. For every dollar of sponsorship that the G-Beta program has taken in, the graduates of the program have raised about $10 to $12. So it's a highly, going back to our mission, it's a highly leveraged way for our program to get a community to invest into itself. And what we're proud of is that many of the startups that emerged from G-Beta were formed because of G-Beta or because of G-Beta's involvement in helping encourage them to pursue entrepreneurship. So we're really proud of the G-Beta program. Uh, it's all over the place. So we run a program in Youngstown, Ohio, focused on additive manufacturing and Youngstown-based startups at YBI, all the way to we run one in Los Angeles at Capital Records Tower with Capital Records and Universal Music Group focused on music tech. And it's been a lot of fun learning about just how incredibly capable community's best and brightest is. You know, I like to say genius is distributed everywhere, but capital isn't. And so being able to get on the front lines of solving that problem, at least at a regional scale, has been a real privilege. And we anticipate the G-Beta program growing. So we're adding about a program every two months right now, and we're hoping to continue that pace you know, for the next year. Our final program, we promise our communities we want to be their best partner to invest into their best and brightest. And to date, we've been serving predominantly entrepreneurs in startups. A lot of them are in tech, but some of them med device and life sciences and even small businesses. We run a program around social impact. But there are a lot of people who are in a community that are best and brightest that fall outside of that vertical. And what could our program do by taking advantage of its core assets of community, mentorship, network experience, social proof, convening power, et cetera, that would be different from what our peers were doing that would better enable us to fulfill our mission of being that best partner for a community. And we took a look at that map of our core assets and where it was that our industry was providing its resources and realized that none of the ranked accelerators, to our knowledge, had built a program for musicians and artists. So we built a pilot program in Milwaukee, um, one fellowship.art for artists and another backline Milwaukee with Radio Milwaukee, which is a kind of independent radio station in the community that's, that's as much a station as it is a, a community nerve center and built the music program backline, which targets uh, emerging musicians in a community. And in both fellowship.art and backline, we granted artists through fellowships, we didn't take any security interest, a fellowship to go through a program that we would give to our startups. Obviously, there's differences between a musician's resources and startup founders, but there's commonalities as well. For example, you don't need to be a 24-year-old tech founder to benefit from mentorship or a 25-year-old engineer to benefit from network and experience and concierge support. So we built that into the backline fellowship dot art programs, and it was some of the best work of our career. We're enormously proud of both of those efforts. And again, to us, they, they are a difference of kind from anything in our industry that's crossed over. And suddenly we're first in our category, which we've, we've been hoping to do for some time. We approached Universal Music Group on that, on the Capitol Records business development team, and said, hey, have you guys taken an interest in music tech with us? Would you take an interest in music with us? and consider expanding that program. And by luck, our partner at TechTown in, in Detroit, through our G-Beta effort, he was the son of a funk brother, if you're a Motown fan. His dad was an arranger who arranged Papa was a Rolling Stone and My Sharia Moore and a whole host of, you know, I heard it through the grapevine, et cetera. 
And together they approached, they were on the board of the Motown Museum. They approached the Motown Museum, which is run by Esther Gordy's granddaughter, Robin. And they decided that they were interested in partnering with us as well. So we, we worked with Capitol Records, which fortuitously owns the Motown Records brand. And with Motown Museum and the Esther Gordy Family Foundation in Tech Town. And built Motown Accelerator, which is a program for musicians in Detroit to go through a version of our accelerator, but affiliated with and uh, working with the Hitsville team. So we're, we're excited that we've, we've now expanded into that program. And all in all, when you ask, you know, what is the generator umbrella? It's really two products, an accelerator that we skin like Grey Goose Skin Spaghetti and a corporate program that we work with technology executives primarily through events. But in all, it's taken on kind of a, like I said, a store with four products. And it's, it's been a lot of fun to build. And I can tell you, you know, none of us suffer from an excess of free time in the company. So it's been almost as much a vocation as it's been a job. There's a lot of paths we could go down here, and I would like to go down all of them, but we have some constraints, so we can't. I'm interested in this music accelerator because it is first of its kind. You mentioned that you don't take an equity position in these artists. So what is the, you know, what is the goal? What is the hope for those programs? Yeah, we believe that communities, I mean, there's, it really depends on the stakeholder and what it is that they need from it, right? The, I think the, the most well-aligned one that is the, the community and the musicians. Communities need, are competing for talent and competing for the claim that they're the best, that they're investing into their own best and brightest. And one of the lighthouse resources in a community is their creative culture, their arts and music. And so for the musicians in the community, by convening and coalescing the, the resources in that community to support them, it's an inevitably better effort than if we never tried. The effect for the musicians is they go through a program, to give a vivid example, you know, during the first month, you'll be working with musicians and producers who are in your industry. So if you're an EDM artist or a hip hop artist or what have you, we'll be able to connect you with the producers and the resources best positioned to help you create art or music without regard to whether you knew them through your local social network or not. In the next phase, we help with the planning of their next two or three years. And so we're connecting them with everything from financial planners to health and wellness resources to basically budget planning to help them figure out what success would look like relative to the creation of music and its promotion and touring and et cetera. And then in the final month, we're working with them on networking them nationally. So we'll take them to meet with placement agencies in New York and with the big record labels in Los Angeles, with venue managers and touring and any resources that they need so that they're networked in the big cities, you know, in the three months of our program more than they might have been in two or three years of trying it on their own and likely you know, forcing themselves to leave, leave our community in the process. So at the end of it, what we want is for them, much like we do with the startups, to experience the growth of two or three years through the efforts of, of two or three months. For the community, by creating this network of the 30 or 40 best musicians in the community, we believe we're giving that community the best chance at retaining them and also of making themselves a creative city where, or a music city or what have you, where the effect of the culture on talent attraction and retention is more than worth the cost of running a program like ours. So it's, I think beyond all that, there's an element of you do well by doing right. By helping these people, I think we're giving ourselves the best chance at just justifying we're you know, worth the chance that we've gotten. But I can tell you, if, the more we look at it, the more I feel like we're just scratching the surface of what communities need to do to support creatives. Does this come from more of a personal or logical like underpinning are you a musician or an artist in addition to being a law clerk or you just have an interest in it or is it just a purely logical play in that cities need these kinds of people and you guys have a great product that transcends no and my joke i I once tried drawing and uh, my wife saw it and told me to stop drawing and she's usually pretty supportive so i'm i'm like the least artistic person you'll know the capability we have is that we believe we're really good at running accelerators. Like when we approach, you know, we, again, the width of the product, we work in everything from medical technology with Boston Scientific to music with Capital Records to insurance with Allianz. That's a pretty wide spectrum of resources, right? And what we tell our partners is we're never going to know your industry as well as you do. There's no way that we could sell you on coming to us as a vendor to help you better understand medical device or music or insurance technology. But what we do know is how to run an accelerator. And we've, we've put a lot of time and attention into that model. And we'd love to build an accelerator that takes advantage of your domain experience and partners with you and your entity 
help do that. And so it came from a belief that there was this dormant capacity to, to use the same thing that worked in building that convening power in medical technology, but to use it in music. So it's weird. It's sort of the same candy in a different wrapper, but the product works. And so that's the domain experience we've been trying to build. And it's been great. You guys obviously, you know, are super intentional about where you spend your resources and your time. How do you guys weigh the decision of building out more programs around the airport in one city versus, okay, time to go to another city and start another community accelerator and be a new community's partner? I mean, it's like one third deliberate and proactive, two thirds reactionary and inbound. So there definitely are programs that we want to build and that we pursue and that we feel like are critical for our program to be the best that it can be. And I'd, I'd put Motown in that category. I'd also put the insurance program in that category. The others are we do get a fair amount of inbound where people are interested in seeing what this could do in their community. And I personally have four kids and my joke is when you reach Delta Diamond, Delta pays for your divorce. So I'm, you know, I, I'm, I want to be home with my wife and family and trying to you know, invest as much time as I can in the things that personally enrich my life. But on the flip side, we, we I think, feel this obligation that if there are communities that want to join with this effort that we want to make the program available, there is an absolute economy of scale to the effort. So if we're working with angel groups in, in Lincoln and in Minneapolis and in Detroit and Los Angeles, there are people who want to invest in startups that aren't maybe a good fit for Lincoln's angel group, but could be a great fit for Minnesota's. You know, if you're building a med device object or medical device technology in Nebraska, Minneapolis and Chicago's angel markets are a great fit for you. You know, if you're building a software technology in Detroit, you know, the Madison and Chicago Angel Networks are probably a great fit for you. So being able to have boots on the ground in those cities that are able to build relationships across those SKUs and size checks that we can better syndicate deals across our network, there is to our company an advantage of that scale. On the, the two measures that we run our company on, we're trying our best at OKRs, if you're familiar with that model. You know, the two things we really measure generator on are the quality and the quantity. And so are we able to, as we're scaling, manage our performance metrics with the net promoter score from the founders, the, the leverage of our programs you know, for the funds, the, the profitability and the, the stock on stock gains, et cetera. So we're, we try to be as deliberate as we can on the quality. And obviously, that's top of mind as a potential trade off that we would risk having if we expanded too quickly. But so far, you know, as we've grown from a team of two to a team of well over 30, I think we've been able to hold that that metric, but it, it's been, you know, a 90 hour a week effort for a lot of people on the team. So it's, it's, it's not a light push. So that talks a little bit about geographic expansion, but what about the accelerator expansion from like a verticals perspective? Where does this end? Can there be generator accelerators for politicians? Those are important to community or for venture capitalists kind of in the spearhead model or other things like, is this going to stay in business in the arts or is this going to expand to other areas of community? I can tell you we have no plans for a politician accelerator, but you never here. I don't want to jinx it. We don't, you know, we're, we're trying to limit our going to that previous question. We're really focused on making sure we can manage the quality and the quantity of the expansion. And so I don't think we can do a, a new product any, you know, any faster than every 30 months in terms of, you know, if we were to do something, it, it's not going to be this year or next year. We, we do as a startup want to take advantage of opportunities as we see it. So, you know, I think you went, you did a pretty good job of finding the pretty extreme end of the spectrum when you outlined where how far it could go. But we're opportunistic, and if we see an opportunity to keep building, we would definitely do it. And I would guess we'd we'd be pursuing you know more industry verticals. You know, we'd be obviously interested. We run an on ramp manufacturing and healthcare. I think those are inter- industries that we'd be interested in pursuing more. In terms of the artisanal space, I think we've got enough just building infrastructure in our current product set for quite some time. But if you had told me two years ago that we'd be building you know, music programs across multiple states, I would have told you that there's an equal chance I'd be left for dead on a mountain. Um, so it, it's been surprising to us how, how the mission's kind of taken form and it's been exciting, but it uh, makes it hard to answer your question about where does it put us in two or three years. When you look at expansion, does it look more like a partnership model like you guys have with, I say Alliance, but apparently it's Allianz. I was wrong on that one. Or the Brandery? Or is it more of a... We're going to do more proprietary stuff. Like we're going to go to Wichita and start a generator program there. Is it more partnership? Is it more proprietary? We try to be as facilitative as possible and not consumptive. And we've had great success. I mean, we're a seven-year-old company. So, uh, you know, ask us in your 20. But 
to date, we've had incredible success partnering with as many organizations as we can to, to build the products. It's a good question where, you know, what, what route it takes in the long run. But whenever we come into a community at this stage of the company, it's always because of a partnership. So, you know, if we were to expand with the fund first, I think that'd be the closest form to what you're describing. And that hasn't been an element of our expansion since we tried Minneapolis probably four years ago or five years ago. So it, it, to date, it's, we've been building this program on partnerships and I anticipate that continuing. There are probably some listeners who are in different cities across the country who are thinking, man, my city could really use this. When you think about partnerships, what are the, the stage gates or the, the key ingredients that you look for to take seriously when that inbound happens? Uh, capability, interest, and resources. So is this someone who's capable of partnering with us? Are they interested in partnering with us? And do we have the resources to make sure we can partner together? If I had to say the, the one I'd choose first, it'd be interest. If somebody wants to work with us, we can usually build that foundation to figure out who would be the groups that could supply the capability or the resources. But if there's not an interest in working with us, it's you know, a hard delta flight back and forth. But those are the three filters we use in determining if someone's kind of, like you said, stage gating through our funnel. And it, it takes anywhere from like a month to we had one that took four years. So you never know. And again, we didn't, when we started it out, I, I don't think Troy and I ever imagined it. I mean, I'm sure we imagined it going outside of Milwaukee and Madison, but I don't think we ever would have put it written into the, to the month by month plan. And we're sort of taking it as it comes. I was talking with our team as recently as this morning. It, you know, when we do an all team retreat, they're flying in from all over the country and we're flying around likewise to come out and engage with them. So we don't know where or how far it goes, but over a dozen cities in, it's been, it's been an cr- incredible adventure. But yeah, if anyone's interested, please reach out. And we're, if nothing else, happy to talk about what's worked for us and what parts of our model are you know, potentially worthwhile or not as they're looking at doing it on their own as well. To close this interview, I'd like to bring it back to where we started, which is you sitting in Wisconsin talking about Milwaukee and your clients as a law clerk and saying, okay, what's this community like? Since then, you guys have created Generator. You've, this is one of your oldest cities. What has been the impact of Generator on Milwaukee? Let's look at one ecosystem kind of as a case study. And you got you to gotta take your humility out of it. Uh, well, I'll do two. I'll do Madison, which is where we, we ended up investing the most. And that, I think, is its own discussion. But in Madison, at one point, the tallest building in the city, the top eight floors were full of our alumni. So you go to the top floor and it was understory. You go to the next floor down and two floors were each street. You go to Aboto, you go to Datica, you go to Akita Box and Grocer Key and, and keep going down. And so Data and others that it was cool personally to walk into a building and go floor by floor by floor by floor by floor by floor, et cetera, and see the jobs that were there that hadn't been there before. And in Milwaukee, we had a company, Bright Sellers, that moved from Boston to Milwaukee and went from three employees to, I think, 50 in the last two years. They just, Steve Case from Revolution just read their, led their A. And to feel like, you know, but for us getting involved, you know, the company wouldn't be here. And the founders are, have always been incredibly gracious about our role in their company's progress. So to feel like you're meeting people that your, you know, desire to have an impact on your community directly affected their ability to come to work in the morning and have a job that hopefully they like and pays well. That, that has been enormously gratifying. The, the part I, I, the way I describe it when you know it's going well is we'll a lot of times go to our offices, our startups offices and ask to meet with the founder. And we know them as like this 24 year old with a trash can dream. And someone will say, well, do you have an appointment? And it's like, do I have an appointment? You know, are you kidding me? Like this, who are you? To, you know, we're, we were with these guys when it was a trash can dream. Just let us take, you know, bring them out. So to <laughs> see them have their own teams and people who apparently need to set up appointments for them is, uh, just a fun day. And I love talking with all of them, uh, the employees about well, where were you before you worked here? And uh, thinking about, well, and someone had to take that job or the job down and seeing the sort of velocity of job creation when you get a community to engage itself has been something that I think has really inspired us. I, I would say, you know, our last premiere night, we went on stage and talked about the Brookings Institute came out with a report that in the Midwest, the upper Midwest, that there are uh, I think 47% of the LP commitments, of the investor commitments in venture funds on the coast comes from institutions in the Midwest. And only 12% of, of that capital goes to Midwestern firms. And so we're about four times more excited to invest in another community than we are into our own. And you're looking at tens of billions of dollars of cash that we've exported to invest in other cities. And I think we feel great that we've 
you know, in many years, we're 20 or 30 percent of the Wisconsin venture capital activity comes from generator graduates. And I think that we've you know, been able to just in one market move the needle, you know, a statistically significant way. And we're the smallest investor. I think we're really proud of. But to see the scope of the challenge ahead of us, it, as much as we're doing, you know, we would need to be doing three, four five times that annually. I think we're as sort of challenged and motivated to go from 20 or 30 percent to how do we double or triple that number? And so I think we're, we're really proud. And, and, you know, the funds are top quartile performers. We're sending the right market signal. But we're very focused on, okay, well, now it's, it's, it's cool to go from 120 to 150 million a year. Why do we get that to two or three or 400 a year per state? And what is an ecosystem that completely goes on offense? What does that look like? I think that's really top of mind for us as we want to go from being 12th to sixth place in the next five or 10 years. You know, I think getting that wind at our back and more importantly, getting that wind at our entrepreneurs back is, is critical. Joe, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you, guys. I'm honored you have had me on. Yeah. If people want to learn more about Generator or if they want to reach out and say, hey, come to our community, where should they go? Generator.com. Otherwise, I'm Joe at Generator.com. And um, I'm Jay Kurgis on Twitter. If somebody just wants to send me a, a direct message. But just reach out to us. We're, I think I try to personally respond to every email. And you know, if not, send me another one and tell me I, I missed my own mark. But we're, we always want to meet everyone we can. All right, Jay, we just spoke with Joe from Generator. Where are your hot takes? Hot takes on a company that's been around the podcast since its inception. It's an interesting growth story, right? They go into different communities and they kind of expand the programs around that. And they kind of just follow what the community is asking for at the time, which, which makes some sense. You know, but we started the interview and Joe was talking, this is a different model. We have five companies as opposed to 20 companies in a cohort but at the same time, they're also doing multiple cohorts. So in some ways, you know, they, they have a very similar model. It's just dispersed. I mean, I love it. I love the different communities that they're going into. And I love the small class in each community. Go deeper with each of them. Support the community's story. It strikes me as, you know, con- it will continue to be logistically challenging across all of these communities. But there are some models that we've seen do really well in that, that way from tech stars to, well, mostly tech stars. <laughs> so it, it can be done. But I especially, here's the hottest take. The music thing is really interesting to me. Conceptually, very much into it. As a civically engaged you know, community member, very into it. As a capitalist, interested to understand how it may contribute to the larger financial picture. But yeah, those are the hot takes. I get it. I get it from a community development point. There, I guess there's two reasons that they really are focusing on the music and the arts. The one is the community side of things. Like one of the coolest things about Columbus, where you live, and Cincinnati, where I live, is that you're kind of surrounded by this art scene, by this music scene. I go outside, there's murals painted on every wall. You have a collection of friends who are artists and designers and artistic people. And that makes your quality of life better as an entrepreneur in that city. So I think if you can accelerate more people to be doing that in your local community, that's probably better for attracting talent to the companies that are starting in those cities. So it's kind of a long, a long play. Second, and I think you're already seeing some of this play out. They have this dedication to music, to art, and now they have this music accelerator for music tech going on in Detroit with Warner Records. So it kind of lays the foundation for these industry specific verticals that they have with insure tech. And I guess the brandery is brand tech. Is that what you'd call that? I don't know. Just branded companies, companies supporting branded companies. I don't know. The brandery probably has a really good definition for what they do, and I'm completely butchering it, but it's in the CPG space. Now you have music tech in Detroit with Warner Records and the Motown kind of vibe. So. It plays into this whole, like, these, these verticals that they can expand into. You asked a really good question about company five that gets into a cohort versus company six. And that type of thing in this model would keep me up a little bit, I think. You know, because if the five companies they're picking are doing so well across the portfolio, and they're narrowing down from an applicant pool of over 600, close to 700, to a top five, it seems... Like, it'd be easy to rationalize your way into doing, well, let's, let's just double the cohort size. Let's do 10 in each community. 
And I wonder if that wouldn't work, why it wouldn't work. I wonder if that might be more worthwhile trying to get to work than doing more and more programs. I don't know. This is this is what's so fascinating to me about Generator. Everything they're doing is working, it seems. And so instead of adding things around it, what if they just went deeper on some of the things that were working? Or is that precisely why Generator works so well? Is because they're not taking that approach, which seems like the straightforward, logical next step. Well, I think it's, he said in his model, you need 60 to 80% 60 to of the companies to go on and raise a follow round, right? So that means three to four of the companies of the five have to go on and raise. There was a follow-up question that I had to that five, six question that we didn't get to, which is the difference between being company four and five. Because when you're in a cohort of five, you're inherently competing against the other ones, especially if you're raising angel money from around the community. No one's going to invest in all five generator companies every single year or every single program. So that fifth company, while it might have been better than the sixth company, could actually be at a detriment for being in generator versus the sixth company, which just wasn't in it. So it's not getting compared against generator companies. That's interesting. I don't know. But to this point, you know, 75 plus graduates, they've raised over 200 million in follow on. Generator as an organization has 30 employees. They're in all these communities. They're kind of following the community's interest in them. I wonder at what point, if any, you would see diminishing returns or diminishing results to Generator going into more and more communities. You know, how many communities can they be in? Can they support and still have this level of success? And if there is no cap, you know, how quickly can they do it? Because I, I would imagine that there are dozens, hundreds of cities around the country that would want to have something like this in their, in their community if it could work. I think the city-based model is less scalable than the industry and vertical-based model, to be honest. I think if you had a generator in every city, it would be diluted to be in it, or it would be the creme de la creme of, oh, you got into generator. And that's a, there's no middle ground there. Or the brand gets diluted if it's the creme de la creme in one city and it's just a mediocre accelerator in another. Whereas if they stick to verticals, they can own InsureTech. These are the best five companies across the nation in InsureTech. These are the best five companies in music tech that are emerging. These are the best five companies in CPG area tech advertising. These are the best five companies in whatever they launch next. So I think that is a stronger play for the brand in the long term than expanding city by city by city and hoping to be num the number one accelerator in every city you go to. That's true. We didn't get a direct breakdown either of for the Milwaukee program or the Minneapolis program or the Madison program, how many of the companies that make the top five were originally from those communities versus applied and, and joined the accelerator program in that community. I can tell you that I really just enjoyed Joe's perspective and the way that he thinks about building community. He seems like the right type of guy to be spearheading this effort. Interesting origin story, you know, sounds like somebody that you wouldn't necessarily would guess would get into startups or economic development, even entrepreneurship in some ways, you know, he, he started in law and just saw this opportunity, jumped in full force and now leads a te team of 30. It's it's really impressive. And I think you can tell the kind of person he is by like the G beta program, for example, like that program isn't equity. They're not getting equity out of that. They're just really fostering entrepreneurship across these different cities. And I think that goes more towards your idea of city by city expansion. I think the G beta program is really that kind of tentacle into other cities. And that's going to be a much more scalable, expandable program to getting entrepreneurs started in entrepreneurship versus, hey, here's the five best companies in this city. Well, looking forward to see how Generator continues to grow and expand in different communities that I'm sure we'll continue to talk to here on the podcast. If you guys have thoughts on this episode, you can tweet at us at Upside FM or email us hello at Upside.FM. And as Joe said, if this struck your fancy and you want to bring Generator to your community, reach out to Joe, reach out to Generator and see if you can be the driver of that change where you are. That's all for this week. Thanks for listening. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's guest. So shoot us an email at hello at upside.fm or find us on Twitter at upside.fm. We'll be back here next week at the same time talking to another founder in our quest to find upside outside of Silicon Valley. If you or someone you know would make a good guest for our show, please email us or find us on Twitter and let us know. And if you love our show, 
please leave us a review on iTunes. That goes a long way in helping us spread the word and continue to help bring high quality guests to the show. Eric and I decided there were a couple things we wanted to share with you at the end of the podcast. And so here we go. Eric Hornung and Jay Klaus are the founding parties of the Upside Podcast. At the time of this recording, we do not own equity or other financial interest in the companies which appear on this show. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinion and do not reflect the opinions of Duff and Phelps LLC and its affiliates, Unreal Collective LLC and its affiliates, or any entity which employ us. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. We have not considered your specific financial situation nor provided any investment advice on this show. Thanks for listening and we'll talk to you next week. Never mind. Bro,